We have our Crops Organic Produce Buying Club for students, faculty, and staff. And I'll invite you at the end of this presentation, if you're interested, I've left some materials about our Crops program here on the stage, or you can ask me about it. We also have events such as Campus Sustainability Day, Sustainability Symposium, and we have expert discussion panels and lectures, including today's event. I'm excited today to introduce this morning's presentation entitled Staying Healthy in Today's World, an Environmental and Nutritional Perspective. In today's world, we face a lot of challenges for maintaining health and for pre preventing disease. This presentation will advance the understandings of the role of the nutritional and environmental influences on health throughout the entire life cycle and the impact of our modern food supply and the environmental exposures on our immune, endocrine, and neurological systems. Now about our guest speaker, Ms. Susan Luck. Susan Luck has worked in the field of nutrition and immunology for over 20 years as a holistic nurse educator, medical anthropologist, and clinical nutritionist, she's been practicing in integrative healthcare models, both in the US and abroad. She's the founder and director of the Earth Rose Institute, a foundation that is dedicated to environmental health education, and the program director of the Integrative Nursing Institute. Ms. Luck is a nutrition consultant at the University of Miami, and the clinical nutritionist at Mercy Hospital in Miami. She's also a national speaker and has written extensively on the role of nutrition and the environment in health and disease. So now, without further delay, please join me in welcoming Ms. Susan Luck. Thank you, Thank you. Okay. So I'm really happy to be here, and thank you all for being here. I will try to talk quickly, use my New York style, because there's so much to cover and a short time to be together. I've condensed this presentation from several presentations that I use at the University of Miami for both physicians, dietitians, and nurses, as well as for community health. So some of it may be basic, some of it may be advanced, and I guess I'd like to ask how many of you are in or studying the health professions? Dietetics, nutrition, nursing, okay. So this, I think, would be specifically relevant to your studies, and for everyone else, it's relevant to your life. So Earthrose Institute was created because I work in the field of immunology and women's health, and I've been very aware of the impact and the increased risk throughout the life cycle, whether it be in early uh, childhood or throughout the aging process, and the increased risk from developmental problems to breast cancer in women. Magic touch. Okay, so we face two crises. One is that we, in our modern world, have a depletion in nutrients that are basically essential for everything from a cellular level to our daily energy to our aging process. And we face an environmental overload. And I want to try to bring that together because our food supply is probably one of the major areas where there is this connection and combination of chemicals in our food chain and depletion of nutrients and how the nutrients are needed to help our bodies to efficiently deal with a lot of the external uh, exposures that we have. So the question that I always raise for people I work with is to start to think about what they could modify in their daily lives that might be impacting their health and to become more aware. And awareness on an individual level is really important, whether we're looking at our personal health, our work environment, uh, or our larger community. I live in a community here in Miami where we have some environmental issues. We've created an environmental impact committee. We work with our local officials and we really become advocates for creating healthy communities. And from a grassroots level, I think we're seeing that from community gardens and many other issues that we could discuss if we had the time. So health and wellness are on a continuum. And when we look at wellness and we look at staying healthy, the area today we're going to look at is the environmental exposures and creating healthy environments and nutritional balance. 
So understanding disease in today's world, the areas that we're seeing the most uh, statistic in, statistically an increase in diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, cancer, heart disease, neurological problems from learning disabilities to dementia and Alzheimer's, younger and younger, but certainly in the aging population. We have to look at what the environmental impact is on that and what the nutritional impact is in maintaining health on a cellular level. So we look at the environment, we look at chemical exposures, we can look at stress and how stress might impact uh, endocrine function, neurological function, certainly cardiovascular function, and also look at diet, lack of exercise, drugs and alcohol, oh, that includes uh, excess pharmaceuticals and the potential side effects, trauma, and we know about how trauma can impact stress and impact um, health and immune function, the field of psychoneuroimmunology that many of you might be familiar with or at least connect those dots. Uh, radiation exposure, probably more research on that and the impact on cancer, uh, the recent uh, catastrophe in Japan will, you know, we still have to wait to see what that impact might be. But on, a, on the level of research that shows that children who have excess exposure to x-rays have a higher risk of cancer in later years. So what we get exposed to early in life in utero and throughout our lives will certainly impact as the normal function uh, health-wise begins to uh, decline with aging. So we have our body, we have this moving in. What the environment can impact is a decrease in energy production on a cellular level all the way into our mitochondria. It can impact our detoxification pathways, all detoxification pathways, skin, kidney, uh, the way the liver processes for eventually being eliminated through the intestines and certainly the air we breathe as a major uh, in inspiration and, and expiration. Uh, gastrointestinal problems can have an impact, uh, be impacted by the environment, often in the foods that we eat. Hormonal imbalance. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, endocrine function is certainly affected by stressors, stressors in our environment, stressors in our uh, daily lives emotional stress, immune imbalance, as I mentioned, oxidative stress if our cells aren't getting the nutrients that they need in order to uh, function and fire and communicate well. So our, on a cellular level, all of this begins to close in. And very often, the first expression of this is what we call inflammation. Inflammation is a trigger of chemicals produced in the body by the immune system and by uh, influencing everything from uh, autoimmune to, to cancer. Cancer cells also need inflammatory cytokines in order to replicate. So it's a big picture, but ultimately, what the end result is, is the increase in chronic disease. And when we see children now with rheumatoid arthritis and with um, type 2 diabetes, which was usually an adult onset diabetes, we begin to question what are the uh, possible influences externally that are impacting our internal physiology and our outcomes. So just to say, we're doing a presentation later on food and culture, but here is a traditional market. This happens to be in the highlands of Guatemala amongst the Maya. I actually took that picture years ago when I worked there in community health. And their diet in that community has radically changed in the last 20 years since I was there. Uh, Sometimes the produce is too expensive. Sometimes the lands have been given to landowners. Uh, sometimes it's cheaper to eat uh, white flour and sugar than corn and beans. And you know, many other reasons for impacting the ability for uh, being able to maintain a healthy diet. So instead, we have this globalization 
of our of diet. And you know, we are now seeing obesity in China for the first time. Uh, we're seeing obesity in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia has some of the largest um, epidemics of obesity in a short period of time. And we can attribute that to lifestyle change, you know, not walking, driving, not exercising, but fast food culture is, perme is penetrating the world. So we have to ask, you know, there's the emerging field that I, I'll speak to for a moment on epigenetics, the way our genes don't change, but the influences to our genes are what is impacting the way they're expressing themselves as much as this emerging field of nutrigenomics. How do nutrients that the Mayans ate, how did that protect them from the ravages of the diseases we're seeing today? That phytonutrients, the natural chemicals in our foods, act to help us protect, to protect ourselves, to help us to detoxify in different pathways in the liver, even the chemicals that we take into our environment. So these components communicate with our genetic information and either maintain health or can change our health. So here's a cartoon that says, and they thought tobacco was killing us, and you look at what's in the vending machines today. This is, this is real. So how do we stay healthy throughout the life cycle? Here are some statistics. Many of you know them. 20% of our calories today come from refined sugar. $30 billion a year is spent on diet soda and artificial sweeteners. I may not have time to speak to it, but I invite you all to go and look at aspartame. That's an equal. And look at what it was originally intended for. And look at the FDA website. There's more health problems and consumer complaints about aspartame than any other chemical or pharmaceutical out there. 85% of American adults are overweight. 50 million are obese. One in three children. Diabetes has had a six-fold increase since the 90s. And we have the highest incidence of asthma ever recorded. And heart disease has doubled in the past 10 years. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, what has changed? Our genes haven't changed, but some information that is communicating with our genes is affecting the way that we are uh, manifesting these changes. So here's some of the factors that also influence nutritional status. It's not only what we eat. It's also the way our digestive system works, and we absorb and assimilate our nutrients, and the way they're taken up by cells. It also has to do with our own elimination pathways that often in a Western modern diet is quite um, unnatural, and so our elimination patterns in our bowels also becomes problematic. I mean, you can just see it by the amount of uh, commercials and products in your local um, Walgreens or CVS or Navarro's. Um, it in, the nutrition also affects our hormones. It affects our um, socioeconomics and me also both ways. It affects the, our productivity if we are nutrient depleted and we're fatigued and uh, we're not feeling well, and it also affects our capacity to purchase good foods if we are in a socioeconomic um, difficult time because to eat healthy can cost more, and we all know that. That, again, a little plug for community gardens, for co-ops such as you have here that I don't know was mentioned, but you know you have an organic co-op, you have organic gardens right outside this building, and I'll address briefly why organic and why it's so important as we move forward. Uh, aging also affects our nutrient status. We know that as people age, they have more difficulty absorbing nutrients like vitamin B12 that fuels the nervous system, that fuels brain function and moods and behaviors. So there's just one quick study. I took out most of the research in here because I thought it was a little um, cumbersome. But there was a study done by Walter Willett at Harvard School of Public Health. And he studied 4,500 scientific studies on nutrition. And in a 650-page report, he reported that 40% of cancers are avoidable. And that the bottom line is eat a plant-based diet, maintain moderate weight throughout life, and get some exercise. What's missing in this uh, recommendation? 
avoiding chemicals in the environment, in the food chain, whenever possible. So I would add that to it, with all due respect to Dr. Walter Willett. So we live in a modern world. We live in a toxic world. We all know that. And this isn't to um, give a doom and gloom lecture. I think the idea is we have some control over our immediate environment and the choices that we make. So the modern food supply, just a couple of chemicals that are in our food supply are our organochlorines, such as atrazine, uh, DDT, and 800 other pesticides and herbicides. Atrazine is the most commonly used herbicide in the world on corn, on sugar. And this is the one that the studies were done to show the feminization of male males in, in, in the amphibian population, that male frogs actually were beginning to have egg sacs, that this actually alters uh, our hormonal and reproductive systems. So that's very serious. DDT was banned in this country, but we have many others that are, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Did I lean against something? Yes. So uh, DDT was banned. It's still used in developing countries. It's still put on our foods and it's still sent back to us. So that although the US, uh, ships it out, we still get it back on many products. So our increased toxic load, we already covered as a major factor. This is just one article in the Journal uh, of Environmental Public Health, uh, Environmental Determinants of Chronic Disease and Medical Approaches, Recognition, Avoidance, Supportive Therapy, and Detoxification. And this was done in Canada at a children's hospital. And it just basically summary, the complex web of disease and environmental contributors is amenable to some straightforward clinical approaches addressing multiple toxicants. And it talks about strategies including nutrition and enhancing excretion and addressing environmental contributors to chronic disease and its broad implications to society and the benefits for improving health and productivity. I think this sums it up, and it is a research study, so it does have validity. Uh, and we also need to look at the financial costs of toxicity, that it was suggested that approximately $568 billion uh, and is spent, between that and $793 billion is spent yearly on environmentally caused illness. So what do we mean by that? We mean children with asthma. We, in, in urban areas, we mean farm workers who are exposed to pesticides working in the fields, cleaning products in our homes that we may have sensitivity to. And the thing about this is some people have better detoxification pathways, some people inherited stronger gene capacity, and so this is individual so that one person may not be affected, at least overtly, and another person has extreme symptoms. Mold is the perfect example. Some people can't walk into a room where there's mold, which we have in South Florida, and other people don't experience any problems with that. So the impact on the body of exposures, and this is just a very brief overview that I've already mentioned of all of the systems impacted and some of the problems associated with it, immune nervous system, endocrine, cardiovascular, and GI. And in this whole new emerging field of functional toxicology, for any of you looking for a new career, it's really looking at how the toxins impact our genomic predisposition and act as mediators that might eventually manifest as chronic disease. Okay, so the National Institute of Environmental Health in this past year, and they're part of the NIH, the National Institute of Health, actually came out with a strategic plan for advancing science and improving Improving Health, a plan for environmental health research, 2012 to 2017. And they are looking at the big influences that have been understudied, all of which interact with traditional 
environmental exposures, the microbiome, for example, and inflammation pathways, immunological pathways, nutrition, and epigenetic processes. And there's a website there, niehs.nih.gov. And you can pull this up. It's a, it's a very big um, study. And basically what this is really saying is that, and I want to, I'm not talking about this today, but I think it's worth all the rest you will talk about, but the microbiome. What is the microbiome? Those are the billions of gut floor bacteria that live in our internal world that actually interact with nutrients for uh, breaking them down in the intestines and for absorption. They help protect our immune system, the majority which is actually in our GI system, as are our neurotransmitters, which affect our moods, sleep patterns, etc. So by not fueling our microbiome by not having enough natural foods and the nutrients in them and not having enough fiber that act as a food and a fuel for them and taking antibiotics or eating animal products that are laden with antibiotics, we are compromising our own internal world of organisms. And that is another part of protecting us from some of the environmental exposures when we do have them. So it's a really important new science, anyone looking for a new career. It's the emerging field. So again, our genes haven't changed, but our environment has. And it's theorized that even metabolic syndrome is a profound mismatch between our environment and previous circumstances that have molded evolutionary selection. And this is from a journal of the American Dietetic Association, 2006. And what this is saying is this whole area of metabolic syndrome, uh, you know, round, around the middle, uh, blood sugar dysregulation, uh, high blood pressure, cardiovascular inflammatory markers, uh, pre-diabetes, pre-heart disease. It's now been categorized as this metabolic syndrome. And when we look at it, it's because we really haven't been exposed to this before. And we haven't caught up in an evolutionary manner. If you think about how long we've had processed fast foods, it's only a couple of generations. You know, probably your grandparents, great grandparents didn't eat this way. These foods were not available, whether here in the States or in, their, uh, in your country of ancestry. So again, the question becomes, how does the environmental factors influence our genes to express themselves differently, even though they haven't changed? And I think these are some of the other areas that uh, we can look at that affect us. So nutrition, lifestyle, environmental, and our ability to rid ourselves of the toxins through healthy nutrition are all part of it. And again, statistics, over 4 billion pounds of pesticides are used every year in the US alone. That's mainly on our food supply. And many of those pesticides also impair our microbiome, our gut flora. 15% are used in gardens and homes, 75% in commercial agriculture, 71%, 14% in forestry. And the Environmental Protection Agency has approved over 350 different pesticide ingredients just to be used in the foods that we eat. So, uh, and the average home has many gallons of toxic hazardous materials, whether it's what you buy at Home Depot for your gardens or other products for cleaning your home. So I think this is worth thinking about when some people say, well, why eat organic? If we think of what is our foods are laden with, anywhere we can cut back and not be bathing our, on a cellular level, our body, it's a good thing. So just to belabor this a bit more, 80,000 chemical plus chemicals in the environment. These are some of the areas. And this is from the uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer. It's part of a US uh, national toxicology program. So this is all legitimate statistics. So here's the interaction of our genes and our environment. OK. You, 
your phenotype. And so we be have to begin to identify the toxic sources in our own lives. And the sources could be water, air, food, soil, dust, sediment, and personal care products. And I'll get to that in a little while. And looking at the pathways uh, for both exposure and elimination are really important, and I've already mentioned them. An increase of toxic load, we've already talked about this. This is specifically uh, Roundup, a toxic weed killer, Monsanto. I'm sure many of you are on um, YouTubes and the email and are looking at the power of the chemical industry. And then there's the whole consumer movement to try to ban these. Monsanto is also part of the GMO culture of uh, genetically modifying foods. And I want to just point out, even chemicals that we don't really know, like arsenic, which is a runoff from industrial waste and even some of the fertilizers that are used here in Florida, can elevate blood sugar levels and cause dysregulation of insulin and can actually contribute to diabetes. Now, who would have ever thought that the chemicals that maybe are in our water or uh, in our environment might be contributing to the increased risk of diabetes? So it's not only stop eating sugar. It's what is the sugar, what is in the fertilizer and the chemicals that are put on the sugar cane that are also influencing. So these are challenges to public health and safety. And we also need to look at what are the short-term risks and the long-term risks. And I have a couple of reports, again, just to say this is now coming to the surface. Uh, this was uh, a report from the CDC that looked at a comprehensive assessment on exposure of the US population. They looked at 212 chemicals, 75 which had never been viewed before. and. Uh, starting to think about what is this exposure in a total way. The other thing is you're going to start hearing a lot more about obesogens and becoming obesogenic. What does that mean? Well, it looks like the chemicals in our food chain that get stored in our fat just like they do in animal products. So when we say don't eat the fat because it's high in cholesterol on the chicken, well, you know what? That fat also has the concentration of the chemicals that the chickens were fed, whether it be uh, chemical feed, antibiotics, or anything else. So it's an additional reason to think about that. And what happens is uh, it also interferes with the body's ability for chemicals that help break down fat to be mobilized. This was a president's uh, cancer report about chemicals in the environment and cancer. Uh, this was from the Harvard School of Public Health, 2011, looking at cancer in the environment and that we need a new national cancer prevention strategy, emphasizing primary prevention that redirects both policy and research for tangible goals for reducing or eliminating environmental exposures implicated in cancer. And again, it goes on, the World Health Organization has said that if we don't cut back on, well, they didn't say why, but they said we expect to see 50% increase in cancer by the year 2020 unless further preventive measures are taken. World Health Organization had a call to action for the same. Here's an interesting one from Harvard going back to 2006 that's called Born to be Big. Early exposure to common chemicals may be programming kids to be fat. So is it the food the child is eating? Is it what they were exposed to in utero? And is it environmental exposures that are causing this epidemic of the fattening of America? And we all have seen the reports they're coming out more and more now that obesity is an indicator for increased risk of cancer. Why? It's a lot of what was just mentioned that if the chemicals are in the fat tissue, we have more of a toxic body burden that we have to deal with. And children who are becoming large early in life, whether it's the foods, lack of exercise and sitting in front of their, you know, um, computer games or uh, eating the way that they're eating and combine that with the environmental exposures. 
So a lot of these chemicals are what we call endocrine disrupting chemicals. I don't know how many of you have heard that term. Endocrine disruptors are actually chemicals in the environment that mimic or imitate molecularly our own hormones and chemicals in both men and women, whether we're talking about testosterone or estrogen. And it's felt that a lot of the lower um, the infertility, lack of uh, viable sperm in young men, and uh, w young women not being able to reproduce without assistance and fertility drugs may be the result of a lot of this. So it's very relevant to people here on campus that being exposed to obese, uh, est estrogen disrupting chemicals, which are also obesogenic, will have an effect on many other factors. And again, here's steady weight gain increases cancer risk. And I just want to point this out. The food and beverage industry spends over $10 billion a year marketing their products to children and adolescents. And most those products aren't uh, grow an organic garden in your backyard or on your window ledge. That's not the marketing strategy. It could be if we all make it happen. So this is just some more diabetes sixfold increase in adults. And the main obesogens that we're concerned with are plastics, pesticides, and personal care products. Bisphenol A in, in soft plastic, pesticides we've covered, and personal care products. When you start looking at uh, what's in your uh, lipstick and your um, suntan oil and your uh, creams and lotions and potions. And I would advise all of you, go to a, uh, a website called safecosmetics.org, and you can look up your favorite product and see what's in it and begin to think about what else might you use. Uh, another piece on obesogens from the White House Task Force, looking at specifically endocrine disrupting chemicals and the reason for increased obesity and how that impacts weight gain. Here's another one looking at um, adipose inflammation, meaning fat tissue, and insulin resistance, meaning that the insulin that our bodies produce to metabolize sugar is not getting in to the cells to actually uh, metabolize. And this is from the Department of Medicine and Cardiovascular Institute, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. And that, again, we need to look at what is this emerging epidemic? Again, I'm just, this is just, I'm just going to go through this. Okay, so here's the major uh, endocrine disruptors that I mentioned. It includes lead and mercury in terms of heavy metals. And then the pesticides and the plasticizers and a lot of flame retardants that are by law mandated on our mattresses, on baby clothes, on sheets. So children are wearing this when they go to sleep, we're sleeping in uh, clothes that have this. Always wash your clothes before, when you buy them, if you can, before wearing them to get some of that residue off. Okay. Other things endocrine toxic uh, disruptors may do are create sleep disturbances. We mentioned the weight, sexual interest, function change, menstrual changes, uh, libido. Um, fertility, as I mentioned, and diabetes. How many of you are familiar with Camp Lejeune in, in South Carolina, or a marine base? What was interesting about Camp Lejeune is there's been an epidemic of breast cancer in men. More than 30 or 80, I'm sorry, I forget because they keep coming generation after generation, some exposed 20, 30 years ago. Apparently, there were fuel tanks leaching into the water supply, and they were exposed to high levels of trichloroethylene and uh, perchloroethylene, their fuel additives, or benzenes, as, as they're commonly known. And this says 70 men were diagnosed with breast cancer. And this is alerted now. Uh, policy and you know the, the the health industry to start to think about chemical exposures because when it was just women it somehow it was something just like prostate cancer oh it's just something that happens 
But now that we're seeing this concentration, this cancer cluster, there are a lot of new questions coming up. And I think this is going to help shift some of the, uh, the thinking about our exposures. Cancer clusters in the US, there's 42 of them in 13 states. And this is uh, really something to look at. We all know about cancer villages in China where the water is contaminated from this sudden increase in industrial waste uh, over one generation and entire villages have this. So when people say what happened, I suggest that before that we start looking at preventive measures. Here's something about farmed salmon. How many of you have seen the uh, EPA uh, guidelines for not eating farmed salmon more than uh, twice a month, actually, although we hear salmon is so good for us? Because there's apparently 40 times more PCBs in salmon than other foods, and that's because the farmed raised salmon are fed chemical pellets that are very high in this. And here's one, not more than one a month, based on cancer risk, neurobehavioral, endocrine. Uh, and the, the, the question really is, you know, how do we eat healthy? And, you know, it's, it's challenging. That's all I'll say. It is challenging. And so we have to be selective. And again, this was an EPA um, recommendation. Just checking time here. Okay. So there are many fat-soluble accumulations in our body, and we don't know what the synergistic effects are. So when the chemical industry says it's safe at lower levels, the question is, yeah. But I had 27 exposures today between food and what I put on my body and you know the cleaning products I used in my house. So we really do not know that. And this is over a lifetime, some of the air times when it's most um, important. Prior to pregnancy, both men and women, young people, that you begin to rid your bodies of some of the toxins and start to think more carefully because studies are showing exposure in utero and pre-utero can have an impact on the health of the offspring throughout life. And then, of course, children, because children are rapidly growing. Their cells are rapidly growing. So developmentally, whatever is in one cell is going to quickly move on to the next. And of course, here again, the timing of exposure and the combinations. And some of the areas we're looking at just with pesticides alone, lower birth weight, uh, congenital problems, most I've already mentioned, and even the increased risk of cancer later in life. Here's a study done with uh, Mexican children and mental developmental problems of their parents exposed in, on the farms. This is how, this was once way before your time, probably your grandparents' time, DDT that was banned in the 60s. Uh, in 1947 was DDT is good for me, put it everywhere, and then it was found out how, how toxic it is. So we've been kept in the dark about a lot of this. Roundup is a perfect example. You can buy it at Home Depot. You probably have it in your house as, for your gardens as an herbicide. And uh, this was an article that the industry knows about this, but uh, regu regulators have had a very strong lobbying effort. So there's a little politics here. Okay, children are vulnerable. We've gone through that. I even want to talk about food dyes and food colorings. Food dyes and food colorings, the FDA knew a long time ago that they were toxic. You know, colored cereals and uh, juju beans and jelly beans and all of that. Um, should really look at how much red dye, number 40, and blue dyes are in the foods that you're eating. Uh, they can cause behavioral problems. They can cause hyperactivity and de developmental problems, especially in children. And I just, this statistic, I don't know if you could see it, but I highlighted Florida. We have a pretty high rate of autistic children among the autistic spectrum, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, spectrum in Florida. And we have to, we also have a lot of agriculture. We also have a lot of golf courses. We have a lot of lawns. We use a lot of chemicals and we don't know how much is leaching into our groundwater. So just something to think about. Oops. Okay. 
So we, I'm not going to go through this, but there was a big study, uh, no, a small study, but it became a big study in terms of looking at body burden of, and pollution in newborns. And in newborns, it was, and this was from the American Red Cross and a group called the Environmental Working Group, EWG.org. And they looked at umbilical cord blood of newborns, and they found an average of 287 chemicals at birth. So, and we know about the, right, the lowering rates of puberty, uh, girls and boys, younger and younger, uh, because of these endocrine disruptors that act like estrogens. So girls are maturing early, and that has a whole other range of issues. Um, I don't think you can see this, but this does have, oops, okay. Uh, because we're getting near time, that cow had a lot of chemicals in it, and that's all it was saying. It had a lot of estrogens, fattening animals up for market early. Uh, wherever I skipped some things, uh, kids playing in the lawn and you've sprayed, I'd be very aware of it, and dogs, and then the dog comes and the child pets it and puts their hand in their mouth. I mean, these are all real. Okay, I'm going to go through this. Just These are the foods that are highest in pesticides. Again, you can go to ewg.org and get a lot more information on this. But these are the foods to be most careful about if you're going to have to choose for economic reasons what you want to eat and what you can afford. Uh, so this is something to think about. And these are the ones with the lowest residue. And I won't go into it, but some of these have natural pesticides in them, and that's why they have lower residue, because farmers don't have to spray as much to maintain their health. They have natural bug repellents. Here's a really interesting study. Children who were exposed to organophosphorus pesticides were put on organic diets for just a couple of weeks. And when their blood was drawn again, the organic diet provided a dramatic and immediate protective effect against the exposures. The pesticide levels went way down, and their health improved. So changing out really is helpful. OK. Uh, these are been, uh, this is just uh, you know, breast cancer, many of the things that are uh, associated with perhaps increased risk, pesticides, dyes, radiation. Um, pharmaceutical hormones, other chemicals. And this is a statement from a big organization that works with the government in Europe who are a little bit more open that talked about breast cancer not simply being a lifestyle and genetic disease, but the result of environmental factors and exposures to chemicals. So again, here are some of the endocrine disruptors in your personal care products. Uh, bisphenol A, BPA, a lot in the news, studies showing that um, now in human studies, not just rats, exposure by mom in utero is an indicator of breast cancer risk later in life as a potent endocrine disruptor in utero. Think about it, plastic bottles and other um, microwaving in plastic, you know, paper, glass is much better. Bisphenol A lines canned food. Some of the companies you'll see now, they're taking it off and advertising that. Uh, associations with bisphenol A. So again, to sum it up, environmental assessment, all, everybody could do in their own lives and think about what you're using and what you might want to begin to uh, replace your products with. You know, lemon juice and vinegar works just fine around window ledges to prevent ants in the kitchen and doors. Um, many, many natural remedies that, you know, your great grandparents and grandparents used before being able to buy all those chemical sprays. And, you know, we need to start greening ourselves, our external and our internal environment. And these are just some of the vegetables that are shown to be have natural phytochemicals that can protect us on a cellular level. So it's not so much uh, what we eat alone, 
I, I should say it's a combination of what we eat and what we're exposed to because a lot of these help with the liver detoxification pathways, especially the last column with the arrow, green, watercress, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, arugula, kale, uh, bok choy, and to say that there's a lot of research now looking at what the names of those phytochemicals are. And lastly, Mediterranean diet, which has been followed in Greece and Southern Europe for um, forever. Uh, more and more studies are coming out, not just lowering risk to breast cancer, but cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease. So what are the common properties in here? Good fats, from things like olives and olive oil and fish. These are coastal areas that when we say fish, we hope that they're healthier. Lots of fruits and vegetables and fiber and uh, exercise. So it's a combination, and this was a very large study looking at the Mediterranean diet. Google it, there's some great research. So again, this is that list I showed you in a different way from Environmental Working Group. These are the names of some of the chemicals in the foods. Uh, curcumin in India, uh, and some of the effects of it protecting the heart, protecting from uh, angiogenesis and cancer signaling. Uh, they also act as, this is a summary, it might be a little much for some of you, but basically to eat a high fiber whole foods diet and avoid a lot of fats and fried foods. And I will end by leaving this up for website uh, if you'd like more information on any of what I presented. And I think I am right on time to the minute. How's that? <sighs> okay, so. Thank you for your attention.